stole a kid of Zeus's, asking me to jump into the fray? My answer is two words. Podcast. The two words, podcast. Well, but the joke, David, you understand, is that in the song, it feels like he is winding up to say new way. No way. Right. right? He's got the arms. He's going, no way. And then Zeus hits him with the lightning. And then he says, okay. And it's a reversal. Okay right. is also not two words. Podcast not is not really. two words. Right. Also, I just went through every other song in this movie, and they're either too hard to sing or too lyrically hard to put podcast into or both. So I decided to do the one that Danny DeVito kind of quote unquote yeah, sings. You were drawn to DeVito. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. That's my vocal range is DeVito. <laughs> hey, kid. You know, we'll, we'll we'll talk about it, but you 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 know that all like someone who they auditioned for that role was like, you're just gonna hire Devito, right? They at in 1993 when this was like in the in the Gong Show period of Disney animation where like anyone could pitch any movie. Someone pitched Hercules. It like developed a little. It lay dormant, and the key part of that pitch was. The sidekick is Danny DeVito. Like, everyone was in such a, like, romancing the stone. You got to have Danny DeVito chasing the heroes, helping him out kind of mode. That was part of the pitch. Then Musker and Clements pick it up a couple years later. They redevelop pretty much the entire thing. And they're like, it should be Danny DeVito as the sidekick, right? They go to Danny DeVito. Danny DeVito's like, hard pass. No, go fuck yourself. They audition. Everyone else in Hollywood. And everyone's like, what are you doing? You're going to cast DeVito. Why are you wasting my time? And it's, the, it's red buttons. Right, was the one who was like, just hire Devito. What are but you was doing? It also, like they they audition like Dick Latessa and Ed Asner, Ed like Asner every for sure. every ornery every guy, every grump, every grump. Ernest Borgnine, right? Borgnine. They just everybody. Borgnine was willing to take a break from his nonstop masturbation schedule to put down an audition for Philatides, and then apparently they ambushed. DeVito while he was eating pasta on the state of a set of Matilda. Yes. Did you see they, this? They, they, they ambushed him during a pasta dinner. Yes. Which is, I mean, you, you know, We're I find that off with that. I find that very offensive. Of course, you can't interrupt a pasta dinner. There's It'll nothing more very, intimate. Exactly. Than a pasta dinner. And I also want to circle back because it got no response. Am I the only one who remembers the thing where Ernest Borgnine was on the Today Show and they asked him what his secret was to living so long? He, he jerks off all the time. Right. It was whoever it was on the show. He like leans in and whispers as if he doesn't know how microphones work. And then it, the sound team fully picks up him saying, I masturbate a lot. I masturbate a lot. Uh, let me see who he's doing it to. It's someone on Fox News. Oh boy! It's like one of the Fox, you know, fascists. It's one of those guys. He said to Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> it's not even that though. It's like just one of the like. Look, introduce the show. Introduce our like. We're 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 so deep already. We're deep. We had to go in we're, the deep. We're end. deep on a Borgnine jerk off tangent. Yeah, uh, uh, Devito pasta dinner. Borgnine yanking it. This might be our horniest episode ever. Just talking about two short, hairy guys in their sex lives. Folks, this is a podcast about uh, uh, hirsute, egg-shaped character actors. It's called Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. Uh, and it's not actually about that. It's about filmographies. It's about directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. And sometimes those checks clear, and sometimes they go to the distance, baby. This is a mini series on the films of Musker and Clements, the Disney Renaissance, through the eyes of these two guys who kind of had the exact, like, kind of the perfect arc to be able to look at this this thirty year uh, journey. The the this uh, part of the the studio went on, uh, and and that kind of changed American animation in general forever. Uh, today we're talking 1997's Hercules, arguably their first bounce. Right, I suppose so. I mean, it did it did all right, but I suppose it it, it underwhelmed. I think this is a this yeah. is a soft bounce, and then Treasure Planet's a huge bounce. Right. That's that's the big one. This one is the the trouble in the water. This is the sort of like oh, 
you know, we're having trouble with the formula. But this is also that weird point where the Disney movies have gotten so big that like this and Hunchback back to back making around a hundred million dollars suddenly looks like a disaster because the movies had become humongous. Um, and expensive. Yes. And I, I'll say this. Our guest today, we have, we have an incredible guest today and he is being so respectful. But what he doesn't know is that's the opposite of what we like here. We live for the drama and we love when a guest speaks before they're introduced. That's how we like to operate. You won't do it. Are <laughs> oh, you supposed to get in here? No, this has um, been really informative because I'm just absolutely shocked. Um, I call this a dip to me this is a, um to me this is like a bible canon pentateuch uh, movie mm -hmm. and you're citing in a hundred million dollar gross my wikipedia showing me 252 on an 85 million okay, budget okay. but is this over time adjusted for inflation what is Th that that's worldwide that's worldwide. I, I will admit, Larry, I'm a big box office nerd. Our guest today, of course, an incredible comedian, incredible actor, winner of a Drama Desk Award. Needs needs no intro. Needs <laughs> Let's no just dive into brass Intro. Hats. I'm supposed to elbow my way in yes, here. Yes, please. Okay, I'm in. Larry Owens, motherfucker. One of the funniest people on the planet. One of the most talented people I've ever seen. When I first time I ever saw you perform, what did I say to you? Is he supposed to remember? <laughs> Something <laughs> kind, I hope. Yeah, I said, you're the biggest star in the world. <laughs> I truly feel, though, every time I've seen you perform, Larry, I'm just like, this is, the, you are going to be the biggest star in the world. You're one of the most talented people oh I've gosh. ever witnessed in any capacity. Uh, in addition to being incredibly funny and uh, smart. Oh my gosh. Well, not as smart as you guys, because I don't know any of the technical stuff. Like, I truly like my eyes are like right now being open to like, oh yes, animated movies have directors. <laughs> like to me, they are like such the property of the composer, the lyricist, like obviously our like stars mm -hmm. and uh and just like to look at this trajectory that uh Musker and Clements yeah, shocked that they didn't do Beauty and the Beast. They didn't. But... They did not. No, that's the one they didn't do. There's like this alternation. They were sort of the default directors and every other movie would be directed by some other team. And the other teams never solidified themselves as much as Mus Musker and Clements, who did a lot of films together and always together. But like the Lion King guys don't make a movie together again after that, I think, you know? And that was sort of seen as the, the B-team movie in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. Hercules was supposed to be, I mean, here's, look, Larry, we're not smart. We're just big old fucking dorks and we're connoisseurs of context. And David and I collect all this goddamn information. But the story we're kind of telling over the arc of uh, these movies, and to some degree, usually our show is a little more auteur based, but talk about Muster and Clements, we really are talking more about the auteurism of the Disney Renaissance and of Mencken and Ashman, you know, and this is the first movie we're covering where Ashman is fully gone, where he's left no work behind. It's Mencken uh, charting new path without him. Uh, and Ashman was very much a, a big kind of auteur figure in uh, uh, Aladdin and uh, Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, which we did not cover. Um yeah, I yeah, the Howard Ashman uh legacy is a huge it is like one of like maybe the only historical talking points which I have in regards to this Perfect. movie in that like I lament the passing of Howard Ashman, I guess marked, you know, significantly by this movie. Um just in terms of like as like a musical theater like lover in the 20th, like born in the late 20th century. Yes. Because to me, that marriage of like humor reference and like pop sensibility, like it's like almost all of any, you know, Disney score in the 20th century is a pastiche. It's a pastiche score of like, writing songs that sound like other things and then of course there is like the disney sound of like go the distance those sort of the like sweeping i want song and i feel like howard ashman just in terms of using that device and keeping it so earnest and unironic yeah. 
like now everything is a comment on sort of that sensibility and I don't like it. But I feel like Howard Ashman had just the perfect amount of like understanding of grit and nuance and like honestly vaudevillian humor as well as like pop styling and like I don't know this just like that like sensibility modern sensibility I, I couldn't agree more and we've talked about it in some of the other episodes but it's like Little Shop of Horrors is my favorite musical ever uh, and and that's such a good example of something which on its face seems like a totally ironic uh, experiment yeah, he's adapting a crappy B movie. Right. And something like this shouldn't be a musical. <laughs> no one cares about this movie. And the amount of emotion and intelligence he imbues into it. But I also think it was like so much of it was his um, sort of you you can if you understand the fundamental tenets of storytelling and of the power of music in storytelling you can turn anything into a functional story you know yeah literally and into like a huge hit and i right. feel like it is howard ashman he was the artistic director coach director of this like very very intentionally small theater called the wpa theater and like and something about like my career having worked only off Broadway, like I've never been in a Broadway show, but like I I have been a part of a Pulitzer Prize winning musical. So like the like the sort of skewed impact uh, perception of Broadway versus like the work that can happen in small spaces, and then how that translates on to, translates to the global stage. Like I feel like by perfecting moments for like that few people a night, it totally informs the intimacy that comes across even in these big budget movies and i just feel like it's just such like a fascinating sensibility and being another gay man from baltimore i feel like <laughs> that I, there is like I know, something in the water and i'm like i want to be heir apparent yeah <laughs> no but i do i think you have that uh, uh sensibility and all the work i've seen you do i mean uh, for for folks who don't know and should educate themselves, I mean, you have such an interesting sort of like combination of influences in background in that you have like musical theater training, but also kind of like hardcore theater Steppenwolf training and then came to New York and sort of found yourself doing stand up, but very much stand up on your own terms. And so you, yeah. you approach things from like a couple different minds equally. And this movie is in a certain way at a cross section of a lot of those things. And I feel like it yeah. is. It is. I encountered this movie in Latin class. So I went to a nativity school, which is, means that it was um, all these like really smart little black boys. And our education was paid for by like nice, kind Catholics in the neighborhood. And but they like it was like a really great education to, you know, get us out the hood and, you know, on to podcasts. And so <laughs> <laughs> we all were required to take Latin and to like we learned about mythology and then we watched this movie over a series of class periods and i was just like yeah i get this like i understand the mythology it's the sound of like my black church that i like <laughs> go to every sunday and then it's like this disney story which is all about like fantasy and destiny and like meeting your fate right. like i it's they uh musker and clements yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is, I mean, it's it's funny. Like, we're talking about Ashman so much, but this is, like, the first post-Ashman-Mencken, but yet you still really feel his shadow on it. They're still very much using sort of all the lessons I feel like he imbued. Yeah, storytelling-wise. Yeah. Also, in terms of, like, let's blend a familiar fairy tale, myth, whatever, with, like, Hollywood, old Hollywood, right? Like, because right. this is... A little screwball and it's got like kind of like a you know a, you know well i mean he's a himbo right like a, a big you know sort of fun doofus as the yeah. lead and then a bunch of wise cracking like that's all ashman energy i guess totally i mean that's the self-referential stuff you're talking about larry the sort of uh a knowing sort of mashup of different pop culture elements it's like you're taking greek mythology like that's the patina that they're based in, then you're like mapping sort of 
uh, screwball comedy energy, like Tex Avery animation energy, right. then the score is very much feels like Phil spector you know? I feel like like the <laughs> Renettes are the main like touchstone for, like aside from Go the Distance, is the one that just feels... <laughs> there's always... We were talking about this. There's always the one that they just had to make as adult, contemporary, easy listening, adjacent as possible. It, it's like the "Who's Gonna Sing It" over the credits song, right? So they yeah. had the Michael Bolton version of "Go the Distance." Yeah, I feel like this movie is brilliant because so there's a rule in the musical theater that you have the first 15 minutes to establish all of the rules like that are going to be at play, and so like in this like in like this like opening shot you get this like charlton heston voiceover so like immediately old hollywood then uh, we like go to mount olympus and it's you know we're storytelling of these muses it's very like contemporary like this is still happening now and then there are like so many like references that follow like that where like the hercules branding it's like they're almost like jordan sneakers yeah. and uh, like very, <laughs> very 1997 it's true yes it's so 1997 and and we just like, and it's a story. And I feel like it's just like, by it being mythology, it just so easily lends itself. Like, it is the actual hero's journey. Yeah. And that earnestness is captured as well in that, in that first mo and like in that first 15 minutes of like, yeah, this is going to be this type of ride. How, do, how, do, um, yeah, I don't ask the question. Ask, no, ask the question. What's your question? <laughs> No, I just love Howard Ashton. I can keep talking about Howard Ashton. I, I, I mean, yeah. we've been talking about him because a lot. This, you know, yeah. we did Little Mermaid, we did um, Aladdin, obviously. Yeah, part of your world and somewhere that's green, kind of the same song, but honestly, like, like use what you know. Like, like yeah, it, it also. <laughs> If you write one song that good, you're allowed to use it five times. <laughs> like it's so good, and they both work so yes, so well. <laughs> like so for well. what they do, for what they yes. do in these, I just love. I, I feel like the only musicals that's like been able to bridge that gap, and maybe it's because of its source material, but is Hairspray, where it's like yeah, each number is pastiche. Like they can mm -hmm. like sometimes go low, but like mostly it is just like. Yeah, let this little fat girl dance. And so it's like, yeah, let this himbo, like, <laughs> find his dad, <laughs> find his parents. <laughs> but also that weird balance of just, like, kitsch with, with genuine feeling, you know? That doesn't just feel like it's in air quotes. Uh, that's, I mean, that's the other part of the soup on this is, like, Musker and Clements weren't really musical guys or fairy tale guys, right? And then they make these two humongous Disney musicals. But the thing they wanted to do the entire time was Treasure Planet. Right. Like That's they the one right. post Aladdin. They're like, now can we do Treasure Planet, the movie we've always right. wanted to do? Because from the 80s, every time they got to make a movie, their first film is Great Mouse Detective. Every time when the studio's like, great job, what do you want to do next? They're like, Treasure Planet. We want to do fucking Treasure Island in space with no songs. It's not a comedy. It's a straight sci-fi adventure movie. And every time they'd be like, that sounds too fucking weird. You have to do one more movie that we want you to do, and then you can do Treasure Planet. And they just kept, like, like Lucy Van Pelt lifting the football and never letting them make Treasure Planet. Do you, so, wait, do you want to know what, much like last time with Aladdin, they picked between a bunch of projects. Do you want to know what the three were this time? Do you know? No, I just know. I mean, it's wild because Aladdin was so fucking big. Big, the so biggest big. animated film ever, the biggest film of that year, and still they were like, you have to do one more commercial movie before you can make Treasure Planet. So then, right, they looked in the pile of all the stuff from the 90s. What what were the other two? Uh, well, they were, Hercules wasn't any of them. First, the, for, the oh. three that they mulled were Don Quixote. Apparently, Disney had a Don Quixote lined up. Wow. Around the World in 80 Days, and The Odyssey, which was their initial like thought well we'll do like a greek mythology thing which and then they realized that there was like a hercules pitch that was simpler and that's what they finally alighted on they wanted but, to do yes. a superhero movie they were like okay we can that that can be the hercules pitch i was gonna say that's the final element in the soup of this movie which is they had been wanting to do like a, just a straight boys adventure movie and so they saw this and they were like, this is an opportunity to do Superman. We could do Superman as a screwball musical comedy influenced by Phil Spector, Wall of Sound Pop. 
He is he is definitely like heroic and it follows like yeah. like oftentimes like the laws of that sort of genre. It's definitely not the dominant <laughs> sort of like energy of the movie, I think. Um in a good way uh because the music i just i'm yeah i always come back to it but uh okay so first of all treasure island honestly sounds good uh, i want to know have you watched it and like does it like hold up in a secret way where it's like yeah it, it flopped but like we're doing that i next. love what you that's our next episode it, it's yeah. it's one of those things that has it has its cult for sure there's a whole generation that saw that at the right age that's like no that movie's good so I'm hoping, yes. I'm hoping that we're going to watch it and be like, oh, yeah, this thing's great. It'd be Treasure Island for these two um, uh, elderly, even at the time, men. <laughs> like, or like, right. like, like that being just like there, I, I, I have to do this. Like, honestly, makes sense. And then also, like, chronologically, like, they're like, space interest <laughs> and then probably like a little like their peak of uh, like this that's entertainment is probably like Raiders of the Lost Ark or like Indiana Jones like yeah. that's where their heart lies and this is literally like matinee fluff to them I get it I understand their psyche I guess yes I think I, w I wouldn't say like I think they care about all the movies they made but it was one of those things where it's like if we could make anything if if we had the blank check as as the premise of this podcast proposes, right, they were like, this is the thing we'd most want to see. You just said the title of the play inside of the play. I love that. Thank you. Uh, hi, hi, uh, folks. This is Griffin from the, the future. Or I should say from the present, but from after we recorded the episode. Um, I'm embarrassed. I try to avoid doing this, but obviously I... I made some grievous errors at the time of this record that I feel the need to jump in and sort of correct and explain uh, now. And, and you know, I think it's a slippery slope making apologies uh, like this at a certain point. It's like, are you going to apologize for everything you say on air? You know, it's podcasting. It's, you know, it's a jazzy medium. You know, we're, we're speaking off the hip. But I, I am sort of, I've been uh, reeling from my ignorance, really, in not acknowledging that as the world becomes increasingly uncomfortable, we're all looking for as much comfort as we can get. And the one thing that I, I know that I and, and probably many others can always count on is how comfortable my purple mattress is. And, you know, I don't want to mince words here. I want to be as direct as possible. That is because purple is comfort reinvented. And only purple has the grid, quote unquote, a stretchy gel material that's amazingly supportive for your back and legs while cushioning your shoulders, neck and hips. I, I don't know how it does it. I really don't. It's just fantastic. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that because of how it's designed, the grid doesn't trap air. Air actually circulates and flows through it so that you'll never, ever overheat. And the grid bounces back as you move and, and shift, unlike memory foam, which... It remembers everything. Memory, memory foam never forgets. You know, and that's why memory foam has craters and divots. And to some degree, I would argue that memory foam itself is cancel culture run amok. Look, I just want to say purple, it's fun. It's comfortable. Of course, I, I've, I've listed all the sort of uh, lifestyle benefits of it, but it's also fun because it's purple. It's purple and it looks like it's something from space. It's got unique grid technology, which is fun to say. It's probably the funniest mattress you can get and the good kind of funny. You're laughing with it. Look, I just, I don't want to belabor this point. I just want to say this is a chance for me to step back and listen for once and also tell my listeners that right now you can try your purple mattress risk-free with free shipping and returns. Uh, financing is available too. So, you know, just to circle back, uh, the main point here is purple really is comfort for an uncomfortable world. Uh, and for, you know, sometimes uncomfortable apologies you have to make. Right now, you will get 10% off any order of $200 or more. Go to purple.com slash check 10 and use promo code check 10. That's purple.com slash check 10. Promo code CHECK10 for 10% 10 off any order of $200 or more. There are two CHECK10s. It's both in the URL and in the promo code. You have to just 
do it twice just to be sure. You don't want to make the same mistakes that I've made in my life. Purple.com slash check 10, promo code check 10, terms apply. Back to the episode. I mean, the superhero stuff comes into play, and Superman in particular, I think, if you look at the changes they make to the Hercules myth itself. Right, where he's he's essentially this abandoned orphan from another world right. rather than the product of a god uh, seducing. Oh, he's both. He's a product of a god, and through a series of, uh, um, you know, godlike events, he is believed to be an orphan, but much like... Annie, that, that's he's a bit of a little orphan Annie, but they drop the he's half mortal because Zeus liked to get around when he would oh, visit Earth. They they have to drop that. That's because... too much for the first fifteen minutes. No, we're not really going to do Nookie. Right. Zeus and Hera become the parents, and exactly which actually it aligns with tenets of uh, Latin class mythology in that they were husband and wife. Yes, right. I mean, I they don't want to have to show Zeus uh, uh, using trickery to fuck a woman on Earth in the first 15 minutes. It's Let's also just... like the song you have to write about that. <laughs> right, right, right. It's just no one wants any of that. But but so their workaround is they essentially give him like the Superman myth where it's like he was the golden child of the two golden people in the golden place. And then he got sent down to Earth. I mean, in this case, he's stolen, you know, but it's like he's there. He doesn't know his background. He's raised by two kindly farmers. And then at a certain age, finds out his birthright and has to figure out how to like fill out the suit. So I feel like that's that's the superhero side of it and that that there's that 30 minute chunk of the movie that feels like it's really following that kind of superman the movie arc and then once meg comes in i feel like it fully just loses to that energy which i think is the right decision a far better energy the yes meg is the because uh, musker i think it's musker yeah i have this interview musker's like w- right we wanted to do this screwball thing where Hercules is Jimmy Stewart, right? He's like the right. the lovable, doe doe eyed idealist, and Meg is like Barbara Stanwyck in the Lady Eve or whatever, right? Like Meg, Meg is yes. Meg is the the prickly. They feel so much. I mean, have you seen Lady Eve, Larry? No. One of the it. greatest comedies of all time. Put it on the playlist right after Treasure Planet. But uh, <laughs> I, I feel like the Henry Fonda Barbara Stanwyck dynamic is almost identical to this, where it's like incredibly powerful, privileged man who's sort of oblivious and easily duped, and the very worldly, wise, uh, fast talking dame. Yeah, and honestly, it was refreshing to see. I loved the um, subversion of trope here. I think something that made me lean in. Powerful feminine energy, uh, man is dunce. It was all reading to me as honestly very true to life. And I think and one of the <laughs> yeah. reasons why, you know, we have we have a bunch of women. We, uh, we have curvy black women. We have Meg. And, you know, very much like you will never. Like, I like love is yeah. like the last thing. And she's honestly nefarious. She's she's a little she's a little twisted. Or I don't know. Is she a prisoner of war or something? I don't like what is that? It's she, her boyfriend died. She made a deal with Hades to bring him back to life. And then the boyfriend ended up leaving her anyway. Okay, it's sort it's of similar. Me a little of that. Uh, what's her name? Uh, you're rip, not your rippy. What's her name? Uh, it's in Hades town. Who does she play? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Eur- Eurydice. Yes. Yeah, yes. Eurydice. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I was like, Euripides, Absolutely. no, bitch. It's Eurydice. And then his name, who does she turn in the pomegranates? Who does she turn around for? Or, or Odysseus. No, Orpheus. Well, or- yes. or- Orpheus is the one who wants to get her back, obviously. Hades Town, incredible. It, it was thinking a lot about Hades Town watching this. You were? Well, just another <laughs> Hades, a different Hades. Like, because the Hades different. in Hercules, he's this, we'll talk about James Woods, but, you know, he's. He's like a Hollywood agent, right? He's like mm-hmm. chatty and he's jokey and he's kind of cynical. And then the Hades, I was thinking about, you know, the Hades of Hades. I was thinking about Patrick Page. Oh, yeah. Patrick uh, Page and Hades Town is not. I thought you like, I was like, I don't know if Patrick Page is giving old Hollywood. No, just Jimmy Woods no. is giving, yeah, fast talking, neurotic. Yes. Right. Very neurotic, literally cigar smoking. Did you see, Larry, the, the public theater production of Disney Hercules a couple years ago? No. 
I was very curious about that. And it seemed like that was probably like it felt like, oh, this must be a prelude. They're trying it out before they try to bring it to Broadway. It and then was, there was yeah. never any talk of that. I mean, like that production got such good reviews. And then there never seemed to be any movement on bringing that thing to Broadway. And the cast was so good. I know. Jelani Aladdin as Hercules. This is what we want to see. Chris Rodriguez as Meg. Fucking yes. slam dunk. Textbook Meg. Roger Bart. Moving from singing voice of young Hercules to Hades. That's a great Easter egg. It, that was fun. That was fun. But the last the last bit of chat about that was um, it, la, this summer, Mencken said, no, it'll happen. It'll go to Broadway. Okay. Like, we have an adaptation ready whenever there is a Broadway again. So, yeah. so hopefully that will happen. To me, that is indication of, like, this movie being, like, beloved and a hit. Like... Disney movies don't get traction unless they have that built-in audience. And, and and just the generation comes of age, like right? Like the kids who saw this movie are now ticket-buying grown-ups. I don't know. I, I think there's another factor here. I mean, I, I need to do a little bit of uh, uh, not mea culpa, but, but sort of like addressing. I, I, in a recent episode, said that this movie was my favorite movie of all time when it came out <gasps> and that I don't even like it anymore, that I had oh. rewatched it some years oh. back and was pretty nonplussed about it. Wow. And I rewatched it today for this, and I don't know what the fuck was wrong with me the last time I watched this movie. But, but like, Toy Story was my big fucking movie for, like, f four years. All I talked about was Toy Story. My parents take me to see Hercules. I turn to them afterwards, and I go, it's a tie. Hercules is tied. It's I the know, only it's movie so I've seen that's as good as Toy Story. And then, like, Toy Story 2 comes out a couple years later. That usurps it. Hercules sort of falls off from the brain. I had rewatched it a lot, like 97, 98, 99, but then I don't see it for a while. And I feel like I watched it very drunk on Netflix like five years ago. I and think it was like a thing. Mad at Hercules. You weren't into it. I think part of it was uh, uh, that I was like watching a movie I hadn't seen for almost 20 years and remembered as being my favorite movie and I burned it with unrealistic expectations uh, much like the phenomenon that happens when uh, adult men see uh, Star Wars movies and get angry that they don't make them feel like a six year old anymore Yeah, uh, one of our great ills of society uh, I, I was able to apply the perspective this time watching Hercules that I always try to apply when I see a new Star Wars movie which is uh, this movie will not make me forget that the world is bad uh, because I know too much now. Uh, the other part of it is, I think when I get drunk, I have a very hard time watching movies that are fast. I become very aware of like edits and rhythms. And this movie is so frantically paced. It is just like the entire movie has genie energy. It's quick, 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 quick. Very quick. There's, okay, so we have, uh, we have our lead. Then we have... Five narrators, five five narrators who sing on pitch and in harmony. Yeah, a then literal Greek chorus. We had Charlton Heston never to be heard of until the end of the movie. Then he has a nemesis. His nemesis has two henchmen. Then <laughs> yes. he, then he gets a, a, a love interest or just a, a, a woman enters, <laughs> and then he gets a coach. And his yeah. parents, and then adopt a parent. So there's four parents. <laughs> like, there's a ton of right. uh, characters. And just, like, pain and panic. Right. Pegasus, who's, like, his BFF. Yeah. There's the Titans. There's a bunch of Titans that show up late. You know, there's, there's all that. <laughs> and the fates. I mean, there's also just, like, Greek mythology is so dense. There's so much more world building. Hermes is a character. Yes, we Hermes. literally see every god, lowercase g, yeah. on Mount Olympus, like, all <laughs> Paul, doing Paul bits. Paul Schaefer as Hermes. Paul Schaefer as Hermes, Hermes, iconic. looks like him. It looks yeah. like him. They did such a good job with that animation. You're like, that's Paul Schaefer. <laughs> it's Paul Schaefer. I remember... This being one of the the kid movies that my dad took my brother and I to that he actually clearly liked. But but when he would talk to his friends about it, like I'd hear my dad in the phone be like, I took the kids to see Hercules. Say, you know, that movie's actually funny. And the only thing he would cite is Paul Schaefer's in it. And he just like looks like Paul Schaefer. <laughs> my dad just couldn't get over Paul Schaefer being in the it's movie. That was the so funniest good. fucking thing in the world. But he's just like, it's like Hermes, but it's Paul Schaefer and he's just agreeing with everything. It's so good. 
good. It's the type of like cameo that I don't think will ever have the impact again, just because of how overexposed celebrity is. That like there is yeah. no like you're in my home every day, but then I go to the mo- like you're a TV star and now you're in a movie. But it also feels like the weird meshing of like all the sort of. Uh, uh, pop culture uh, sort of reuse we are talking about where it's just like it's not like they're putting Kim Kardashian in a Disney movie like it's a weird pick it doesn't (laughs) feel like they're putting Paul Schaefer in there because he's a big name cameo it feels like they're putting him in there because they're like what's a funny person to play the yes man, you know? And then they're like, oh, Paul Schaefer's a yes man. What if we just make the character Paul Schaefer? And he just talks like Paul Schaefer. Uh, it's so bizarre. But yeah, I mean, it's it's just like this movie is uh, uh, so much my sensibility in so many ways. It got kind of mixed response from critics. It got like it did okay at the box office. D- but I Disney feel- fatigue. People were just yes. getting a little tired of every year, you know, the big the, it, I, it's that's what it was. I think that's a huge part of it. I think the marketing for this movie was fucking relentless. They also mm. pinned a lot of like they a lot of toys. Yeah. A lot of toys, a lot of everything. Like the every Disney store was changed into a Hercules store. Do you remember all this New York shit that they did? Like they they did some fucking Central Park thing and they took over all of Chelsea Piers and made it a Coliseum. And then they no. had a Hercules parade. And when the movie opened, it was only playing at the New Amsterdam Theater for the first week. They did like the limited run thing. That's where I saw it. It was Disney had just bought the New Amsterdam. Lion King hadn't opened yet. So they had Hercules play there as a movie for two weeks. And it was just like particularly in New York, the the Hercules shit was relentless. And I think Katzenberg was more and more trying to push Disney away from girl princess stuff because they wanted to get the boys on board. And they sort of in the process might have alienated some of their like died in the wool audience. But I think the reason why it's reputation so much better now, Larry, is I feel like this is kind of the favorite Disney movie of a lot of people who work in the media from our generation now. You know, I I think because of its weird sense of humor. I think so. There is this phrase. It comes from a musical. Yes, it's called. It says. I'd rather be nine people's favorite thing than a hundred people's ninth favorite thing. It's right. definitely that energy, right? It, yeah, and it's like unapologetically, like yeah, like about like a, a Disney movie about a male like superhero in a way that I guess Aladdin kind of was, but I don't know, Hercules. I don't know. It just has a different edge. It's just a little bit edgier. Yeah, it's about getting famous. It's about weird things for a Disney movie. Its specificity is what makes it charming. And I think yeah. that, like, I think that if Meg were the center of the movie, she would not be allowed to be as complex. She would have to be flattened to the, like, Disney standard. And yeah. so, yeah, I like, you know, Musker and Clements paying their penance to, okay, bars. Musker and Clements paying their penance. <laughs> Yes, bars. Uh, um, I, I I feel like the like confidence and like sort of like later career nature of like some of these like really bold choices for Disney like for me makes it makes it yeah you're right makes it a standout yeah. for me. It, it represents like some sort of like departure. Maybe it's the Ashman thing, but like it does feel like. It, it feels separate than Aladdin and yes. Mermaid. It's also like, you know, like Jafar and Aladdin and Jasmine are pretty straight characters. You know, it's like Aladdin has that division of like, here are the comic relief characters. Here are the heroic and villainous characters, you know? And this is a movie in which every character is comedic. The whole thing is just top to bottom comedy energy. You also have a very different visual style. Like, it feels like they're really, I mean, they're obviously trying to, like, incorporate, uh, you know, Greek art and all of that. But it just has very different sort of shapes in it and a different kind of score and, like, different action sequences. Like, the Hydra sequence is very different than any action sequence in, like, Aladdin, partially just because of technological advancements and budget. I don't like the Hydra sequence. I love it. I think it rules. You love it? Anything in rules? Yeah. It's so it's sort of video gamey. I I it's like okay. that it's sort of video gamey. I just think it's it's cool. It's like uh 
it's got such a different uh, vibe. And it's also they just like were able to at this point pull off like camera moves and shit, which they could barely do in Aladdin. Everything's so kind of locked down. Because- <laughs> stiffy, stiffy. This doesn't feel stiffy, stiffy. This feels new, modern. It feels closer to 2000 than it does to 1990. This is true. Yes. It just like all of it feels a lot closer to just like we're going somewhere different. Like even the pace, like probably like Nickelodeon yeah. is just like such a machine now. And like Disney Channel's like they're starting to, which is like Disney Channel television is just Borscht Belt vaudeville like these <laughs> kids like they sell a punchline uh a three stack build like they sell it to the balcony on television and they like do a hundred scripts like it is truly like little rascals type training yes. for an actor and tonally like if you talk to a kid like between the ages of like eight and 11, their personality is actually wisecracking sidekick. Like they very <laughs> much have like, why I oughta like they, like a kid will say that. So then you're like, who taught you that? And it's like, it's fucking Miley Cyrus. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. It's also like, so, I mean, you, you look at, so it's Aladdin, right. And then am I forgetting one? No. Yeah. It's the three Disney you, movies. Mean? The three other Disney animated films that happen between Aladdin and Hercules, between the two Musker Clements, are Lion King, not in order, are uh, Lion King, Pocahontas, and uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. That's in order. Well, so, you know what? I got it right by accident. But uh, all three of those movies are definitely trending more serious, right? There was this thread of Katzenberg, like the two things you hear about Jeffrey Katzenberg running Disney animation at this point in time was he always said like, I want more edge. I want more reverent. I want more pop culture references. And he wanted to win best picture. Like Katzenberg got so hard when they got Beauty and the Beast nominated for Best Picture, and that was the first animated movie, that he kept on going like Pocahontas, Hunchback, Lion King. They're tragedies. They're like big tragedies. Pocahontas especially. I think he, for whatever reason, thought that was going to have the right mix of like prestige and class and star power Epic with like romance, Mel Gibson and shit. Right. Yeah. History. Right. It's going to like be Beauty and the Beast but leveled up. We've got more money, we've got more time to do it like and then Pocahontas is uh, I think, you know, uh, it's a little snoozy. I you know, there's things that are fun about it. I you know, I Kind of like how I, it looks. I don't know how you guys feel about Pocahontas. I don't want to come too hard. It's never been a favorite. I, I, I like Pocahontas a lot. It's an imbalanced, imperfect movie, but I like it a yeah. lot. What is that? A Steven Schwartz score on that? It's a Steven. It is. It's a, it, it's well, no, it's Mencken. But wait, uh, it's Mencken and Schwartz. Yes, Schwartz. Mencken Schwartz, and Schwartz, Schwartz is, working together on Pocahontas. I mean, well, the story is gonna be tragic because that's just what she wrote. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, and so, yeah, and I, I like, it's just, in terms of like, I, I actually don't have a huge appetite for this, for, I'm like trying like to not to offend my future bosses. I'm like, I'm like, I don't really watch <laughs> animated movies. Like, or maybe I'm just like, not like a Disney gay or a princess girl. Like, sure, I'm, sure. <laughs> I like my musicals live. I like my musicals sanguine, flesh and blood, okay? White woman out front. Well, that's another thing for me that I find interesting about Hercules, which which rewatching it now, correcting my my past uh, uh, greasy talk about it, I do think is my favorite of the Musker Clements and my favorite of this Disney Renaissance era. Uh, it's just so my sensibility. But um, I, I feel like, A, it's the one that has live musical theater energy something about the relentlessness of it and the kinetic energy of this movie and how fast it moves really feels more like a staged musical than an animated musical film um and i also think that like the those films right they picked more tragic source material right But they also, I think, were going for that sort of prestige. They wanted seriousness in the eyes of Hollywood at large. And this movie is like owning being a cartoon, not owning being a 
Disney movie is owning being like a fucking Bugs Bunny cartoon to a certain it degree. Has, it has Bugs Bunny energy. I don't know where this is, how the related this is to uh, Space Jam, but I don't know. Something about it feels hand in hand. Same year as Space they're Jam? You're a year apart? No, not the same year, right? Space Jam's 96. You're right. You're a year apart, yeah. I think. And, and, and you know, the whole section of him, of Hercules being merchandise, you know, that's obviously Michael Jordan satire, right? Like all the, 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 the big gulps and the, all that stuff. Air Herc. Um, exactly. <laughs> Air Herc. Exactly. But, but I, I, I mean, I can't agree with you, Griffin. But we then we have to talk about David Zippel. Then we have to, you know, this is this is the guy coming in to replace Ashman as the lyricist here, uh, with working with Mencken. What do we have strong opinions on David Zippel, Larry? Do you? care about david zippel <laughs> i have a i have a personal connection to david zippel david zippel you is do. a friend very okay. very sweet charming person this is perfect let's talk about it then because i don't know him well F- fantastic lyricist i uh david's credits goodbye girl on broadway buried at peter's vehicle uh and Which is, I, that's with hamlish right that's marvin hamlish i think yes marvin music. hamlish yes, yes. and then city of angels i believe he's a lyricist of that so these just like really, really like stalwart like show business uh like like shows. And so I feel like sort of like that show business edge uh comes into play here. And I find that like the lyrics, like they're so like I feel like it is definitely completely hand in hand with like understanding the assignment of like Howard Ashman did this really well. Like things are conversational, they're breezy, it's contemporary vernacular, but with always the reach to pull from anything in history and assume that our audience knows what this is. So it's an intelligent but innocent listener. And so I feel like that carries through in terms of like the voice of the show. And he has a a lot of fun with like and this perfect package packed a pair of pretty pecs like he's having fun he's showing yeah. his pen it, it feels like cabaret right like it, it's 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 clever it's it's like it's yeah like, it's like meant to be listened to and understood in a way that like yeah. a musical theater lyric is distinct in that way like a pop lyric the chorus has to be pronounced but like you really don't know what ariana grande is singing and like you prefer right. it because she's literally like oh no that's selena gomez uh, you got me walking side to side to me one of the like a a more lewd song than WAP because she's literally like I got rocked and now I can't walk correctly (laughs) this is Selena Gomez Disney star you got me walking side to side (laughs) and so you don't know that that's what the song's about because you can't hear the lyrics but David Zippel's lyrics are now I have to shout out <laughs> my beltresses, the vocalists, the ladies, multiple Tony Award winners in this group of singers playing the muses. We have his Calliope, Lilius White. We have his Turpus. I don't even know. I can't really do it. It's, uh, it's <laughs> Lilius White, Roz Ryan, Cheryl Freeman, yep. Lashans, And I think oh. there's one other female Vanessi- vocalist. Vanessa Thomas. Vanessa Thomas, who like I like I don't know what her stage career is, but the uh the four women that I mentioned just like like so indelible to the like growth and life of Broadway, the roles that they played between them. Uh and just just as a group, like as like a girl group, the energy that they infuse into the score and the like amount of storytelling that they truly cover as these yeah. direct to camera narrators and also just like the style that they bring like they dance like they're gorgeous like they represent this like very very fierce modern sensibility of the show and this tearing down of like the literal fourth wall and also the yeah. energetic fourth wall of like we're having fun like like this isn't this isn't beauty and the right. beast we actually like actually <laughs> one of the easter eggs visual easter eggs uh i think like a scar or Mufasa is in the clouds. Yes, it's somewhere. Scar. No, no, Scar is when Hercules is posing for his painting. He's wearing Scar as a pelt. As a pelt, it is <laughs> a skinned Scar. Yeah. No, it's. I mean, uh, no. you can hear the pen is a great phrase, Larry, which I'm going to use all the time oh, now. In a good, in a good way. I mean, lyrics. sometimes it's a bad thing. But here, <laughs> in a really positive way. Yeah. What were you going to say, David? Sorry. A bunch of things. One, I agree with you, Larry, that yes, the muses, they're setting the temperature of the movie, which is what you need. Like, right? Like, that. It's here we're having, this is this is going to be silly. It's going to be referential. It's not going to be disposable. 
like because it's right. fun but like you know they, you know and i love the look of them but i wanted to ask you if you knew who the first choice to play the muses was it's uh a, it's a very 1997 choice tlc the spice girls they oh, wanted wow. the spice nice. girls Oh Which my is gosh! Why there are five muses? Why they are? Why they wow. are a five a five <laughs> person act? Um, and I I have no idea. They they declined whatever they yeah. you know it's the it's the height of the Spice Girl yeah they're, it's uh, a busy I mean honestly moment. it's a lot of development like to like yes. they like the involvement um there's like some really great like making of and you just I just love to listen to Lilius White who sings like the lead muse I just love to listen to her stories of making it and how they like you know consulted them about their design and like Lilius is uh she's like zoftig and curvy but she yeah. you know requested to be a slender muse like. Her, her muse does not resemble her. Roz Ryan, who is like the shorter, more curvaceous muse, like it's that is very Roz Ryan energy. Uh, and and just yeah, I love it when they dance, like they like the movement for the muses, if recreated on the human body, so would be impossible. Yes. And it's just so fun. <laughs> it's the same with how Meg is animated. I was gonna say, too. Meg's the way, silhouette, the they, yeah. It makes zero sense. I mean, it's just like every, I, I love the weird angularness of the designs for these characters because I feel they look like, like they're on a vase. That's what I right? love about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Vaz. Vaz, yes, yes. <laughs> it's a Hercules joke. But that's like that's the thing. Like Zero to Hero has so many fucking funny jokes within the lyrics. Jokes, jokes, like, jokes, jokes. Jokes, jokes. Right. I mean, he could tell you what's a Grecian urn is like. Like, wait, okay. So I think jury's out on this lyric. So you believe it to be what? He could tell you what's a Grecian and urn. And then sometimes and I, I hear he could tell you what the Grecians earned. Mm. So I think the joke is that it sounds like both. That it sounds like. He's telling you what a Grecian earns and what is a Grecian. Yes, earn. a brilliant lyric. What's what's a Grecian urn? Right. Yes. He could he could tell you what's a Grecian urn, which is hilarious. Right. Because you're like one Grecian, like even just like a passing like music man, uh, high school. You know, you've been in a production of Music Man. You're like one Grecian urn, and then so it's right. you're already pricking the musical lover's ear, and then it's funny, and then it's a double entendre. He could tell you Hell what the yeah, Grecians baby. are. <laughs> which is hilarious and the literal pitches that she's singing on it's just like so perfectly placed in the power part of her voice wait now i'm david zippel hey hey uh zero to hero is what is one of the songs i like sing while puttering around my apartment wow. the most and has always been and i think it's just because the 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 lyrics are so jokey that they're wedged in my brain forever. It's a top to bottom remember, showstopper. Like the first time you yeah. hear it, you're just hit with like the velocity of like seeing an amazing musical theater number, which like there is no other feeling like that. Like when you see it for the first time, you're just like, I want to hear that again immediately. <laughs> and you can't because yeah. there's two more hours of show. There's no CD, whatever. And you just have to live with the song until you hear it again. And then for people who love this movie to officially learn the lyrics, to like break it down, like for a kid or like a young person discovering what these lyrics mean. Like oftentimes you have to ask your parents, like, what is, <laughs> you know, like, like what is all about Eve? Cause it's like a reference in like a, a movie and they're like, well, it's this, this, this. And so you really learn about life through these lyrics that and these references that happen in passing. Aladdin has that too, right? Yeah, that, which Ashman, right? All, all that, all that little referential stuff to where you're like, as a kid, you're like, well, I get it, something. I, I get that this is something I want to know about. Yeah, like then, and like how like comedy, like how you just hear the inflection of comedy, even if the joke's not for you, like you just still know that something's funny. And then the, like, and then truly learning about things that you wouldn't learn about in school, but just like popular culture role things from these movies that like pass on this sensibility like something i think about a lot tangent as a creator you know who's very intimidated by like tiktok burns through material intentionally like uh, am i a font mm. of creativity or do i have like a fix you know and it's like <laughs> no people like kids will always respond to live comedy because they're being taught it in these little moments yeah. Like there's like a jazz a jazz cue in a in a Disney movie makes someone like hear La Vie en Rosa in real life and and have a attachment to that. Like La Vie en Rosa the song is never going to die because it's used in these properties. Like it's still being and, passed and, on. Yeah. 
And like Bugs Bunny teaches you vaudeville and shit. I mean, it's like all this stuff. There's like co comedy weirdly. I mean, the weird self-referential element of comedy ends up functioning as like a history of itself, you know? Like yes. all comedy is influenced by, I should say, all the influences that go into any work of comedy end up becoming weird uh, sort of indoctrination tools into those different voices and sensibilities. I mean, it's just our shared history of like what we acknowledge right. to be either true in life, so it's funny, or to be presented in a way that's like not quite like life, which is like fun to watch. And it's just like how we cope. Like it is, it's, I don't think it's ever going to go away because humor is like one of the most universal things like not everyone has been in love but like everyone has laughed period mm -hmm. you know like not everyone has parents but like everyone has laughed like period yeah um and so yeah i just love uh i don't know i feel like the in the the comedy in the in the in the lyric writing zero to hero is just such an amazing song those references and the alliteration and how specific they are to the singers as black women like like using like their their natural vernacular and patterns of speech and then like to thinking of them as truly muses who hold the history and also like the future truly of hercules and their like genuine excitement for the character and sort of the double entendre of uh, like by telling a story of gods, they use godly music, aka gospel. Normally, I hate um, when when white composers uh, lean on black uh, musical it's idiom. Menken's idea, apparently, yes, yeah. Uh, like I, because like because normally it's a very uh, mm, canned and artificial version of <laughs> sure. the spirit. But I, because I think it's like so dramaturgically important as a way in of telling an epic story. It's storytelling music, right? Like yeah, telling yeah. a community story, like a telling a, a good news, a gospel, a literal gospel uh, in terms of that framework, it allows the music to blossom and then to keep like subverting that and, and, and playing with like the contract of five female singers or like I won't say I'm in love just becomes you know like probably the most Ron Nets Phil Spector of the references for me I think that's that I think that's the that's my favorite I mean that's just a, a bananas good song I love that it's song so I love how it's uh, portrayed as well but it's just that's just a that's why I want to see this on Broadway someday like I, I want to see that I mean I would like to see all of it obviously but like I would love to see that done f to a crowd yeah, just like an honest moment, like when you when you're excited for an adaptation, so you can like, so that you can see someone just like deliver a killer song in front of an audience, which is all that theater is. Versus like, I want to see how they do the um, what do they call the hydra? The hydra is whatever. like the it's titans, gonna be yeah. there was gonna be um some some fabric and some lights, honey. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, who gives a shit? You want to you want to see fucking Krista Rodriguez sing that shit with emotion? Yes, That's the special with the effect. girly with the girly singing and you want to hear her check yeah. the grin you're in love it's like, no, not clean See, they need, they're going to be clean vocals <laughs> at the same time and I also wanted to say before I forget my wife uses the the muses in this to teach her kids uh, she's a teacher about the Greek really? chorus yes because that's cool and, and the muses right like because if you're getting a bunch of you know 13 year olds to read the Odyssey or whatever like I feel like the chorus is something that is hard to summarize yeah. or whatever Anyway. <sighs> okay. I'm dreading this. Um, just gotta do it. I just gotta say it. Folks, this is Griffin from the future of the present again um, with another addendum to this Hercules episode. Um, you know, I, I benefit from multiple forms of, of privilege in my life, both systemic and, um, you know, uh, I don't know, circumstantial, specific. And sometimes that blindsides me, I would say, from, you know, realities of the world. I, I just, I'm, I'm, it's just, it's ignorance. It's ignorance. I'm not saying that as an apology, as an excuse. I'm just saying it as an explanation. I am trying to apologize here. I'm, I'm trying to express real contrition because I forgot to mention that with HelloFresh, you get fresh pre-measured ingredients and mouthwatering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. And I just feel so bad about it you know that i just wasn't even 
thinking about the fact that HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking fun, easy, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Look, to a certain degree, I think the damage is done. And I'm trying to figure out how I can best start the healing for others. And for me, it just feels like I need to address a minimum of two bullet points. I would say, for one, HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so that you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or less. And secondly, I would say that HelloFresh offers 25 plus recipes each week featuring a range of flavors, cuisines, and ingredients so you'll never get bored. And in fact, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm no longer going to let myself get by and doing the bare minimum. I'm going to address three bullet points. Eating healthier has never been easier with low-cal, carb-smart, vegetarian, and pescatarian options every week. And no matter what you choose, every single recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers. So, you know, in the name of radical transparency, I will just say, uh, you know, as a person who lives alone, uh, HelloFresh is... Um, godsend uh you know let's just say that uh, no one in my apartment is good at cooking because i live alone so anything that gives me a leg up on that process is is much appreciated uh you know don't have to go out to the grocery store don't have to be a analysis paralysis of, of oh too many recipes online no they're just sending me the box with the recipe i know what to make i stay home it's nice i also I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. I personally love the switching between the brands, but, you know, I, I, I don't mean to project that onto others. I know everyone's experience is different, but my listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount with me if they want to. Folks, I don't want to mince words here. The, the thing I'm about to say next absolutely must be read verbatim go to hellofresh.com slash blank check 10 and use code blank check 10 for 10 free meals including free shipping i implore implore you all to do this and in the process avoid my mistakes uh once again that's hellofresh.com slash blank check 10 use code blank check 10 for 10 free months including free shipping it's hellofresh America's number one meal kit. Now back to the show. I just want to say, because you guys are talking so lovingly about this. Griff, you're saying you're singing Zero to Hero. And I feel like you maybe like this I was, movie less. Yeah. No, I don't know. I like the movie a lot. Every time I watch, I've but the things I've seen this movie like three times in my life. And I don't know why it was never in my rotation, except maybe I was just like a year or two too old for it. You know, like I was 11 when it came out. You're kind of starting to, you know, write like, not just watch Disney movies anymore, right? You know what I mean? And like, maybe that's the difference. Like, I feel like Hunchback was the last Disney movie that I remember being like pumped to see in the theater. And I remember seeing Hercules and like being like, oh, that was fun. And like never thinking about it again. And because it was light, it wasn't trauma. You were like, hold on, I'm not attached like literally to the trauma. It was too light for you. You're like, I, I want to also... <laughs> I just want to say, it, I was like someone who was a 12, so I think I aged out, but I also was just like, this is like homework. Yeah. Oh, oh you just didn't because like, it was like you, you saw was the like, ancient setting nope. and you were like, no. Nah, I'm not. That's the stuff I try to not do at uh. like at school. <laughs> I've, uh, I've heard of Hercules. Funny, He's like, some old guy. Yeah, it's like, I, it's a book or something. <laughs> <laughs> is, is this it, the exact. Is this the exact same year that Hercules the Legendary Journeys the, the, premieres? The Kevin Sorbo show? Yes, my background yes, I, right well, now. Well, you Zoom. have a background. Your background, I believe, is just of Kevin Sorbo, the man. It's just Sorbo <laughs> being intense, serving uh, looks. That, yeah. that show began in 1995, so it's already been running for a couple of years. Yeah, so I feel like that stole some of their thunder. I do think there was... A little bit of Disney fatigue, as you said. I think it's weird because it's like this movie, in a way, feels like such a um, uh, an attempt to uh, make a hairpin turn away from the increasing sort of self-serious stodginess that the the increasingly dramatic yep. Oscar yep. 
thirsty films had had. But I think so many people were just off the train at this point that you couldn't get them back on. And then it's like, I feel like there's this movie and then Emperor's New Groove is three years later. And Emperor's New Groove is like this, but without songs and just fucking comedy. And similarly, kind of underperformed in theaters, kind of got a shrug from critics and now has like a really positive reputation. Obviously, it's right. great. But-, but I think people were like, this isn't a Disney movie. Like, this isn't what a Disney movie is <laughs> supposed to feel like. Emperor's New Groove, uh, tonally to me, I don't know, to be totally very, I don't know, it's giving me Lauren vibes, Lauren Michaels vibes. It's got Lauren vibes. I mean, David Spade is involved. It's got some Lauren vibes. Is that is is that why I was like, hmm, this is going in a, like, a, it's going in a, straight direction <laughs> it's, it's got it's got david spade uh okay babe energy why am i saying okay babe that's dennis miller the other thing about emperor's new group griff is that it was going to be a self-serious epic and disney yes turned it into a comedy which is a weird you know th- like a weird microcosm of that them being like oh god or, should we have to stop being prestige like should do we have to do something yes. different that was also a Hail Mary pass to escape the film being canceled entirely. Like the self-serious version of the movie was such a disaster that they were like, give us a weekend to rewrite it and just turned it into a parody of itself and like cut down the budget. And then the film got made. It cut down the, the film. That film is like 75 it's minutes. So long. Short. It's so yeah. short. Right. Yeah. And it was made in like a year. I mean, everything about it is just like trying to I, I think. It's you have Hercules, then you have like I know it's not Mulan. straight away, but you have Mulan, Mulan and next. and Tarzan, which Tarzan. zag back in the other direction and are bigger. Tarzan hits. is like Hercules, but not funny. Like right. it's also a superhero story about a himbo, but then I don't remember it being funny. Like it, it just forgot to be. Funny. I think it kind of sucks, and the Phil Collins music blows. Uh, but it was a huge hit, and then after that, it's like. Emperor's New Groove, they're just doing fucking comedy. It's not even a musical. And then they do the back-to-back Atlantis Treasure Planet. Atla- I was wondering when Atlantis came into yeah. all of this. because totally- You gotta go to Atlantis. You gotta go. They do two back-to-back like sci-fi boy Hell yeah. adventure films with no songs, and both of them bomb so hard. And Treasure Planet is the one where they're like, we're canceling all future plans. No more hand-drawn movies. Uh, but also <laughs> worth noting, of course, that like Katzenberg is over at DreamWorks at this point, spooling up like Prince of Egypt. Like he's like, well, I'm still going to make, you know, these like big self-serious musical epics Yeah. Uh, over here. He does uh, Road to El Dorado, right? Like he's trying to sort of keep the Disney thing alive and failing, I guess. Sinbad. Sinbad. And then it's like Shrek is like sort of the like accident off to the side that ends up fucking right. everything up. But this movie, I mean, Katzenberg must have started on this and then gone over to DreamWorks yeah. during the development of this. Yeah, right. I believe. Yeah. Because, you know, the, this thing, they started whatever, working on it in 93. Yeah. Um, it, and that Musker and Clements come in and they're like, it should be a screwball comedy. Like, uh, bring that energy into the screenwriting. That's uh, they want to. They want to do a bunch of Michael Jordan style, right? Like they want to mm-hmm. parody like celebrity culture in the 90s. Uh, and as we mentioned, they read every ornery old guy in the world for Phil and eventually hire Danny over pasta. Susan Egan, uh, who plays Meg, had to basically beg for this role because yeah. they were like, no, you're Belle. You can't be Meg. You're you're, you know, sweet, innocent Belle. You can't be flinty, clever Meg, you know? And so she, she, like, she had read for every single female lead in the Disney Renaissance and wouldn't get right. it, would come close and wouldn't get it. And was begging them, was playing Belle on Broadway at the time. Exactly. And was like, let me come in. You all close your eyes. Let me record the dialogue. I'll sound like Barbara Stanwyck, animate it, and then get back to me and tell me if it works. And they did that. And then like six months later, they were like, we looked at the animation test. It's good. You got the job. She's great. She's uh, so good. Tate Donovan falls into this weird category of, I feel like. Tate like to- Donovan. But like Tony Goldwyn playing Tarzan. Like there's this era where it's just like Tom Hulse playing a hunchback of Notre Dame. Like you get someone who's like a known actor, but isn't really a movie star is kind of a leading man who never became a leading man. Right. Not really like a himbo. And he is yeah. a real life himbo. Remember when he was on friends, he had like curly hair and he was yeah. dating Jennifer Aniston in real life. 
And it was like, oh, is this like a guy we're going to have to... I love Tate Donovan. I enjoy... I just like. I, but like I enjoy dad Tate Donovan right like I enjoy the OC and, OC and Tate Donovan is where yeah. we get peak Tate yeah I Tate agree. really grows into he's it he's a little lost in the 90s I, I like Kenny Lonergan Tate Donovan on stage mm-hmm. uh, but as a kid who was so movie obsessed and when I would see a movie I loved as much as Hercules and, and then ask my parents 5,000 questions because I wanted to know everything about it I'd be like who is Tate Donovan and they'd be like He's the star of Love Potion number nine. He sure is. <laughs> like so often with these movies, if I liked a film and then I'd be like, Danny DeVito's funny. I got to watch Danny DeVito movies. You know, I'd be like, this is my new right. favorite actor, this voice. You really and they do? Were, you, you, I, you, find, you find some people you like this way. You do. But Tate Donovan, they were like, there's no real path for you to go down as a Tate Donovan fan. As an eight-year-old <laughs> Tate Donovan fan, there's yeah, not like, really sorry. a syllabus we can hand you. Stick around, you know, in 15 years, this guy's going to be given great, you know, supporting role. Like yeah. he's going to play managers and club owners. It's going to be a lot of fun. He'll be on damages for a long time. He'll be like the other guy on damages. Remember when he just kind of clung on for dear life on damages? Does no one want to talk to me about damages? Yeah, that's that's you. That's some you territory, that's David. But- damages, okay. Glenn Close is my new best friend. Uh, I was in Montana. <laughs> She li- famously lives there, and yes, we did hang out. Oh, did, did you, you really? Absolutely, Larry. There are twelve people in Montana. Like, yeah, we like we truly ran into her in the corner. Wow. <laughs> David is holding. A, is this a cardboard sandy or is it a screener? It's a screener. I mean, if I had a cardboard sandy of Hillbilly Elegy this fast, that would be impressive. I I just want to make this very clear. David has his Zoom background on with the photo of like the the Titans on the, the vase. Titans. I love how they're animated. They're fun. But because of the way that Zoom virtual backgrounds work, where they're trying to identify what the background is and what your face is, the the DVD screener of Hillbilly Elegy David is holding up. It, it's cutting out the back. It looks like it's just Glenn. You're right. So, you're right. Right. So it just looked like David was holding up a cardboard standee of Glenn Close and Amy Adams and Hillbilly Elegy, which he what? had on his Mama, desk. Did you talk about Hillbilly Elegy when you when you hung with? with Glenn? No, we were castmates in a virtual benefit of Angels in America. Love it. Uh, this summer, yes. Awesome. Uh, she played Roy Cohn. I played Belize. Um, and so we, we we chuckled about being uh, castmates virtually. And yeah, and then um, yeah, we helped to move a, a chair. Uh, uh, Larry, the side tangent here. Uh, you're, you're an excellent on-camera actor as well. But you are like such a live performer. You're one of those people who it, it is so infectious to watch your energy on stage and how much you clearly feed off the energy of an audience and work with it and everything. And you've done like a bunch of these fundraiser things recently. I mean, you had like a small part in the Ratatouille TikTok musical. Yes. And you did the Angels in America thing. You've been doing a lot of these like live uh, streamed, you know, web piecemeal kind of let's try mm-hmm. to do the equivalent of a show sort of thing. Like, how are you dealing with the uh, the absence of live performance right now like the the <laughs> absence of that energy i mean it's like i'm just really biding my time and sure. <laughs> I, there's nothing to replace it there's like nothing to do it really is like i have to submit to yeah. it, it's the most vulnerable i've ever been in my life because i don't get to air out my dirty laundry that's, either that's why as I subtext asked. or literal yeah. text <laughs> <laughs> right, that's why I ask because it's just like if if you've had the honor of seeing you perform, your thought is like, oh, this guy lives on the stage. Like this is just I I rarely have seen someone this at home getting this much power from this and and giving this much power. Uh, and it know, would when, just when, be a lot. It would be a lot of moments together with people, like together with the right. audience, together with like a fellow artists, like and that is like. It's just a true, true, true lack. And uh, I always say that, like, one of the deadliest things you can do in Corona is sing in a group because of the droplets. Yes. Uh, yeah. Like, you can't yeah. gather an audience. Like, and so, like, it just has made me really, like, a true um, movie reference Avenger in terms hey. of just, like, really wanting to have, like, a very, very, like, pro-quarantine lifestyle, like, trying to do as much as I can to encourage everyone to look out for the collective good so we can get back to that sooner. 
Um, and then when we go back, I am so excited. There's a vaccine now. And I'm just going to absolutely just like pump it like it's gonna be so <laughs> fantastic to like have a room full of people like clapping again and laughing and it's gonna be so phenomenal um and but right now i'm my own grip i'm my own sound person and it fucking sucks yeah, it sucks <laughs> sucks a it's like i'm not i i no part of me ever wanted to be my own tech and b all the sort of half measure like a uh, uh, sort of uh, facsimile sort of of live performance shit ends up just making me miss live performance more than Literally. if I wasn't doing anything. The amount of work that I've done with my skills so that I like strategically do not have to do tech. And now, yeah. but again, it's very, very humbling, humbling time. And I, and fortunately I feel like I'm getting better at, the thing that we have to do now like i have a ring light like the most important element of all time yeah. i have this microphone like it's i i and honestly like for the tiktok ratatouille like tiktok acting is different babe like you oh yeah don't even don't look at the camera and don't pick an eye line you look at yourself that is weird. I didn't think about that, but that is crucial to TikToks. They're looking like over the hair. Did you watch the TikTok Ratatouille, David? I did. Absolutely. So I'm I'm not going to drag anyone or praise anyone. I'll be as vague about this as possible. But it is very interesting watching that thing, Larry, and seeing the different choices people make with regards to eyeline and some of them work much better than others. There's just like, if you use the platform, like to a certain degree, like you just understand like that certain, and it could even be generational. I yeah. think, I think it is to a degree, but it was very interesting to watch like performances superimposed next to each other side by side. And like one person is looking at cue cards. One person is looking at themselves on camera. One person is looking to the side, pretending that they're looking at their co-star. As someone who had to submit a sum total of three lines to that operation, like what they did, like was fun, like, like unbelievable. Like truly like, it, like I, like the organization, I mean, just some behind some BTS. And, like I worked so hard on my three lights. If I had anything else, I would have been, you know, showing some, it's like on chopped, like don't make too many dishes. Okay. It's also, I mean, I, I want to make it clear. I'm not throwing shade at anybody. It was impressive what they put together. What's interesting about it is watching the learning curve of these things in real time. You know, where it's just like people having to figure out what the language is of how do you do a filmed musical where no one is in the same room? And it's just trial and error. Yeah. Um, David, I think all your reasons why you didn't connect with Hercules... I, make I think sense. I was just too old for it. I had seen Independence Day. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I was just like, oh, like, I've only been seeing kids' movies. And when you're, like, 11 or whatever, you know, suddenly you're like, whoa, there's a whole other world of movies. And I probably, and I didn't own it on VHS. And I, whatever. It just was never, but anytime I watch it, I've always had a fondness for it. I think it's very clever. I really like the animation style. I love James Woods, unfortunately. I've I mean, talked about this go, many times. We unfortunately have to talk about this. How he's one of my favorite actors and he's like the worst <sighs> person in the world. And I don't want to say much more because I don't want him to sue me. No. But uh, he's very funny in this. And it's similar to like a Robin Williams thing where it's clearly a very ad lib performance. And the animation feels like it's trying to keep up with him. Yes. And there's like just a dynamism to that that's really cool and it's, and I, it's also yeah. trafficking so much in his persona as a movie star that's the other thing with robin williams the analogy is that it's like it's not just oh james woods happens to be the voice of hades it's that this movie's characterization of hades is he's a james woods character yeah yes it, weird to think that that was once a thing though that was like yeah yeah james wood he'll he'll give you a great character you know what i mean like, sure, he could be a star for you, but also he could be a great sixth lead. Like, that was his whole 90s vibe. Like, he, he could play did a, a lot role, of sixth lead. He could play kind yeah. of a comic role. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Ugh, I Do you know the, talking the, about the, it. He's like, of course. Like, how incredible is he in The Virgin Suicides? Like, a movie you forget he's in. Like, yeah. A, just a devastating performance. Like, 
the fuck happened to this guy? Yeah, he he was an incredibly good actor and is an incredibly bad person. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just fascinating, but it's like, I, I don't know if, I mean, he's been shitty for so long that whenever I last rewatched this movie, I'm sure my opinion of James Woods had already been totally tainted, but now it's so beyond the pale. And watching it, I was like, this character is so good. This performance is so good. The Just the animation acting on Hades is so impressive. Like his weird fingers. The design how- is cute. The design is so fun. It's so like magical, but he looks yeah. menacing. He looks terribly evil, but also slick. Yeah, I mean, there's just the 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 character animation in this movie is so fluid, while the designs are so detailed and complex. Uh, it, it, I really think this film is is kind of maybe the most impressive of this era, just as a technical achievement um but like i was telling you we were talking off mic david about how i had rewatched a a bug's life recently uh, a movie i had not seen in a couple years another movie with a canceled villain yes right and i was a little bit worried about watching a bug's life again because of the kevin spacey thing and i was like am i just not going to be able to get over it and the thing is he's very good in that movie, playing a fucking horrific, monstrous creature who is very similar to Kevin Spacey in real life. And sure. and the character is not a Kevin Spacey archetype in the same way. It's just Kevin Spacey providing the voice of someone who's awful. So you're able to sort of transfer your contempt of the guy over to your contempt of this villain. But then Hercules gets into this zone of like, he almost looks like James Woods, you know? Yeah. No, yeah, it's true. He does. I mean, sort of. I, I he also has blue flame hair, but it's true. He does. And but it's I like the animation is so like the way he lights up when he's angry. Yeah. He's so clever as well. I don't know. Do you know. know do you know the story about the casting on this? Um I think that I knew that it was Lifko, right? Like that that, well, that, that that was the initial Oh no! Okay, no, no. We, I, That's no, the one right, in between, no. right? So Devito was first priority. We got to get Devito, right? And we yeah. talked and about that good. whole rigmarole. And, and, and we enjoy Phil, and he, he, he right. makes sense. Yes. Rip Torn feels like that had to just be a very short walk to get to that casting. At this point, he's in the pocket. He's on Larry Sanders. That's good. Hercules Tate Donovan feels like it was their lowest priority. Just get some hunk to do that at the end of the day. And then we already talked about all the hoops uh, that uh, uh, Meg had to jump through. Susan Egan. Yes, but, uh, but also, you know, some of the little, like, love Bobcat Goldthwait, obviously. Like, yeah, some clever yeah, little, Matt Fruer, yeah. right. Bobcat. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. This is almost like a, a, an early Bobcat reclamation project because he's kind of like a little bit washed up at this True. point. He's a little wildernessy. You're right. You're right. Bobcat, this is good for me to isolate. I watched um, mm, it is a Whoopi Goldberg movie. Uh, a Burglar? Burglar. And Bobcat yeah. Goldwait is in that movie. And wow. Behavior. That's that's the thing, though, but he had one of those arcs where in the 80s, everyone was like, can't get enough of this fucking guy. This Bobcat energy's out of control. And then around 93, everyone was like, fuck Bobcat. Throw him in a furnace. We never want to hear that guy again. So this movie is coming like four or five years after Bobcat's sort of become Pauly Shore in people's eyes. Yeah, Bobcat, grateful for this. uh... Yeah, grateful for this role, as, as you sing, Larry. But as you are trying to set up Griffin... DeVito is the one who suggests the casting of Hades that I believe you're about to talk about. Yes, because they couldn't solve what's the energy for Hades. Hades should be the dynamic genie style character. What's the energy? And DeVito said you should get Nicholson. What would be funny is if the Lord of the Underworld is Nicholson and you have it be the Nicholson persona and whatever. So he is such good friends with Nicholson. He throws it over to Nicholson and Nicholson's like, I'd love to do that. Sounds great. Nicholson comes to the table and he goes, here's the deal. I want 15 million dollars. I respect it. I respect it. And 50% of all Hades merchandise sold because that was his Joker deal. Sounds like a good start to bargaining to me if I'm Nicholson. They wanted him so badly for Batman that he negotiated that deal where it was like 5 million but he got 50% of any merchandise that had the Joker's face on it and he he made the most money that any actor made for a movie and that record stood for like 20 years. So he he just saw dollar signs here and was like 
okay, that's the deal. It's you're giving me 10 to $15 million, 50% of all Hades dolls. And they were like, cool, cool, cool. Here's our counter $500,000, which, which, you know, Jesus, I mean, like, they're like, look, just here's 500 grand. I mean, Disney are cheapskates. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that that's a good offer, but they're like, it's a week of work. What the fuck? Just come do it. And also Robin Williams had gotten $75,000 for playing the genie. Rude. 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 But it's like, 15 is so outside of the range of what they even consider doing at this point. Then you get like, I mean, you know, fucking four years later, five years later, whatever, Mike Myers gets $20 million for Shrek 2. Like then it starts to become the era of if it's a sequel to an animated movie and you cast a big famous person for the first one, they get fucking 20 million the second time. But at this point in time, no one's going to get $15 million for doing the villain role in an animated film. Right, but so then they hire Lithgow. They spend nine months trying to get him to work for the role. I don't really know what that means exactly, but they finally fire him, and they bring in Ron Silver. They bring in Spacey. They bring in Phil Hartman. You know, a lot of the the the, the era's wise asses, like scary wise asses. Rod Steiger, I can't imagine that. James Coburn. And a bunch of others, you know, million people. James Woods is had this is his it's his whole character. Like he comes up with the interpretation. Right. Like he it's it's his whole idea. I mean, when you say you don't understand what they meant by Lithgow not working, I think it's just they didn't fucking know what the character was. Right. I and mean, he didn't and have it, a take. Right. Like and and Woods came in and just came up with this whole thing and gifted this movie with his toxic energy, and for once found a positive receptacle for it rather than uh, Twitter. Yeah. Uh, I mean, have we, we've, I feel like we've talked about everything. What, what, what are we missing here? I mean, we, we should go through the basic plot of it. I feel like not that, I mean, we've talked about the, the broad, broad strokes, but you have, as Larry said, this sort of like, I mean, this is another reason why this movie's in my wheelhouse and it's it just a thing I've liked ever since I was a kid, but just fucking bathos humor always gets to me. Anything where you inflate shit with pomp and circumstance and then deflate it immediately, cut it down and like slap it down with some silly shit. I also just like that this movie has like full on Looney Tunes, like if Hercules sh- shakes someone's hand, then their fingers are crushed and red and pulsating. It has so many like boing like weird sound effects and shit. Uh, but but this movie has so much world building to do at the beginning because like Greek mythology is so much more convoluted than most of the worlds that they've set these films in. You have to set up like the rule of the gods, Hercules coming down, Hades ruling the underworld, half of his uh, immortality getting drained. You know, like there there's a lot of sort of larger shit to set up, which the film does very quickly and does mostly through the the Greek chorus, the goddesses, which is uh, yeah, so smart. It's the the use of them is brilliant. The, right, the the plotting, uh, whatever. Like yeah, they have to sort of get around. So he's just the son of gods, and he he almost drinks the mortality juice, but not all of it. That that's that's all fine. I, I this is not a movie where the plot matters to me as much. Like the the final you know showdown with Hades is not maybe as operatic, you know, as, as oh, that's still pretty good when he dies. Yeah, the, thank you. Like, but, you know, you yeah, know, it, it's good. But like, I, I'm more like this movie for the, the characterization of Meg, the weird humor, the like, you know, the cleverness of uh, the lyrics, all that stuff. But I also think, uh, you know, Hercules as a character, I mean, there were like two fucking recent Hercules movies that no one even remembers existing. It's even, true. Even though one of them starred the biggest movie star. The Rock? But I think the character, Hercules, despite a lot of uh, uh, himbos wanting to play the role because of how it looks, I think it it often gets foiled by how kind of inherently boring the character is because he's just too perfect like he's just too kind of uh strong in every single sense and i do i do genuinely like i'm just a sucker for this shit but i just it works for me to make hercules this like oh awkward gangly tripping over himself knocking over a fucking coliseum like i like that yeah it doesn't know how to handle his power shit and it means that once Phil does train him and he does become a fucking hero, he's still got that insecure dude energy, which I like. You know, it's like he still carries with him. Yeah, he's hot. He's like hot and sweet because he's kind, but his body's good. 
And uh, yeah, I feel like Titi's like not wanting to train him. We love that. Just love like, it. No, good, good opening act arc. Good, yes. good, good tension to it's lead like, off with. No, yeah. I don't want to do this. Also, just a little shout out to the Fates when she holds the eyeball. Oh, like those three crones. We just love crone work. The Fates the whole rule. Thing, great crone work in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who the crone wrangler was, but it must have been one of the best. Amazing. They were. Le- Legitimately scary. The fucking world building this movie has to do. It has to set up that shit with the fates and the future, the omen, the strings of life, the well of souls, all that shit before Hercules even is born. It's all true. I just think the movie's like does a pretty good job of getting through a lot of shit and setting up both the world of Greek mythology. I mean, the Disneyfied version of Greek mythology. Yeah, and, that's the thing. I, it's yeah, it's it's simple. I, yeah, no, it's but good. but more importantly, setting up setting up its own internal story stakes, which I think it does well. Like everyone has very clear wants and drives. Phil wanting to have his kid. You know, I feel like it is buoyant energy throughout, which I love as a viewer. And I feel like as a departure from the gloom and doom mm-hmm. prestige, I I don't know. I just it just feels like such a I don't know. It feels like a, it feels like a well balanced movie. Mm. It feels like actually just like enough like humor and heart. Like the balance, it feels it feels like they it feels like they knew that they had to work to get that uh, Ashman quota. And I feel like they they like it, it was That's, good. It's good. I struggle with heart until Meg shows up, and then I'm then I'm all in on that front. And then you get that little jolt just when you need to, and I, so I feel like yeah. that is like a compliment for the pacing because like these movies, like they just like they're just long. Like that's honestly like my qualm is that an animated Disney movie is just as long as like a real person <laughs> movie, and I personally can't. I can't. I was like, no, I've already seen it. I've seen it. I've seen the animation is cute. And then, like, the boss, it's always when, they, like, the boss, like, I think that every Disney movie should end right before the boss. Before they get to the boss level, you're saying? We, yeah, we've seen them do yeah. enough. Now we just have to bring in, like, a Gorgon. Right. Uh, Aladdin's 90 minutes. Her- yeah. This movie is 90 minutes, right? Uh, Little Mermaid is less than 90 minutes. The, when, Aladdin gets turned into a live action movie. Somehow it's two hours, 15 minutes long. Like, they did that to Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. I don't know what they'll they'll turn they'll do this, Griff. I assume Is, isn't one the, day. Isn't the threat? Wasn't the thing announced that it was going to be the Russo brothers doing it with Alexander Sarsgaard, which sounds like the exact wrong combination? <laughs> uh, yes, it did. I mean, it was very vague, uh, and they were the Russo brothers were very much like it'll be really different. It won't be a literal. But that's my thing. I'm just thing. like, are they just going to make some new live action? And I'm like, right. Oh, so you're just doing another Hercules movie? Movie? like who cares who fucking gives a shit but that having been said i don't know how you translate this film to a live action movie the energy is so specific to animation and could only parallel to the stage it need whimsy it needs whimsy yeah and the movie would have to live action movie would have to suck out the whimsy to be uh literal because these disney remakes are cut like they literally are coming out so hyper literal. Like yes. when the animate, like with like how they looked at Beauty and the Beast, I was like, ew. And then Aladdin, <laughs> I was like, what? It was like, so you so you did a live action just so you could do CGI people and CGI green screen sets? Like you're animating the humans and you're animating the set. Like and, and such a big part of this movie is just their faces and their bodies moving at a speed and in shapes that human bodies cannot. <laughs> Truly. They, they, right. And they instead, right, as you're saying, with the live action, they just go grounded. They go. The Lion King, oh, not, oh, not no, be paying no. $15, $30 to watch a National Geographic. Okay. No, who gives it, a shit? I was like, what? This is National Geographic without the verisimilitude. Stop. An- another one that is somehow like 45 minutes longer. Yes. Like, even though it adds nothing. Right. You're like, this, sort of- this is somehow word for word remake with 40 minutes. It's added on. There's no clear. It was the word for word remake for me. It was okay. It it was word for word remake uh, with the exception of one scene. And sometimes it was in my stand up act. 
where I where I went to go see Lion King alone in IMAX. I was the only person in the theater, live action, and there's a scene where a piece of dung rolls across the savanna <laughs> for five minutes. <laughs> Rafiki of true to life mandrill picks a feather out of the doo doo and says, "It is time." Like it is so <laughs> Larry, unbelievable. I forgot that scene existed. Uh, the do- the- nope. The dung beetle scene? Yes, it is. It is truly a uh, a bug shit scene. It is a, in IMAX. Yes, uh, demented. Uh, can I say I I think I think I like a lot about this movie and why I prefer it to Aladdin. It is just my taste. It is just my preference. You're, you're, it, you're, you're. it is my tempo. I'm not saying it's better. I know people will be angry, but. Like, a thing I like about this is I kind of agree with Larry on the perfunctory of the final boss battle in these movies where usually the villain takes some new form and the stakes are just like, fucking whatever. The guy's going to win. How do they throw him off a cliff or down a pit or whatever? Like, how's the guy going to get foiled? I like that this one, the stakes are less about him defeating Hades and more about the knot of him needing to prove himself and Meg needing to get the curse lifted. Like, I'm more invested in in the final test of this movie being Hercules sacrificing himself, jumping into the well of souls, being ready to die, having that prove his heroism, turning the string gold. Like, that stuff I like. I think that's good plotting. That stuff is all great. I just don't like you bringing Aladdin in because Aladdin's ending is the best because Jafar turns the palace into a horny capital (sighs) of mayhem. And then Aladdin slides on a jewel and tricks him into becoming a genie, it rules. There's no one to throw it into a pit. It's the best. The genie's thick, yeah. And the genie is so thick. Pretty, Aladdin's is pretty good, actually. You can get that visual, yeah. that, like, gold visual. So good. And, and just just how horny everything is. Like, that's what I love. It's like, Jafar isn't like, I'm evil now. He's like, what what's happening now is this is a horny space. That's what's happened to Agrabah. Sure. That's what I am bringing in as, as Sultan. I'm just saying I prefer this. This is just my taste. That's that's fine. It's, it's fine. It's, it's all good. You just don't, don't cast aspersions on Aladdin's ending. I'm sticking up for it. I like that their kneecaps look like triangles. Yeah, it's great. We love that. It's fun. Yes, absolutely. Great kneecaps. <laughs> Best kneecap. It won the Academy Award for kneecaps. Best right? supporting kneecaps. Yeah. Folks, hi. This is Griffin from the present slash future again. I promise you, I'm not here with another apology uh, of my own wrongdoing. I think I've I've done enough atoning for this week. Um, I feel like the bit would get old if I hit it a third time in one episode, but. I have to acknowledge um, the damage caused by someone in our community this week. I'm speaking, of course, about um, what could I call it? The tirade that the Cineas Cow went on over on Twitter last week. Um, the Cineas Cow uh, shared some opinions that we here at Blank Check do not agree with. I mean, fundamentally do not agree with and do not condone. They do not reflect us. I understand that sometimes she works with us on ad reads. For Mubi, but um, she's not an employee, and you know we need to have a conversation with her and see if you know she actually feels remorse and and shows understanding of the damage that her statements caused because she led people to believe that Mubi is a curated streaming site where every day one movie leaves and one movie gets added, and they're always 30 movies and only 30 movies available for streaming. And that's just not the case anymore. It's not. Society has changed. We've moved on. That is not a reflection of the present because movie has evolved. Uh, Every day, movie still premieres a new film, whether it's a timeless classic, a cult favorite, or an acclaimed masterpiece. It's, you know, a movie you've been dying to see maybe or one you've never heard of before. There's always something new to discover. And and with movie, each and every film is hand-selected. Listen, yes, Cal was right about that. Not to make it sound like I'm equivocating for her, but there is a benefit to that. I mean, it means you'll never spend time looking for something great to watch or or even, dare I say it most horrifically, spending more time looking for something great to watch than you would actually spend watching something great. It's it's like its own personal film festival streaming anytime, anywhere. But the, but the key point here is that movie has changed to a new format. They have a library. 
there's a larger, more evergreen selection of titles that are staying up for a longer amount of time. So you're not on the clock with Mubi anymore. And I, I regret that the Cineas Cal misrepresented the situation, made people feel that pressure and that doubt. I hope this can be a moment of healing and reflection for the Cineas Cal. Um, you know, we would love to welcome her back if we felt like she actually had an understanding of the damage that she did. And as a sort of mea culpa to our listeners, I'd like to um, give them the opportunity to try Mubi for you for 30 days at Mubi.com slash check. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash check for a whole month of great cinema for free. It's got hundreds of great films that have been handpicked by Mubi's curators, timeless classics, award-winning masterpieces, festival, fresh gems, discover the best of cinema streaming anytime, anywhere. And um, I hope that's something we can all come together on and use this as a learning moment to find the points on which we can all agree and unify around because we need each other these days. That's movie.com slash check for a whole month of great cinema for free. Okay, back to the show. I'm trying to think if there are other things we should talk about in this film. We hit all the songs that I like. I I don't, I don't like, and this movie lacks a, a sort of boring ballad. Like I like uh, everything here. Like, you know, I, I, there's, there's not like a sort of plotting number. The boring song is I can go the distance, which is the, that's I want fine. song. And that's a better place to put the boring and it's song. early. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, it's moving, it's moving the plot. So that's okay. It's actually a good song. It's just, I argue a key or two too low. I believe his in the movie, uh, I will find my way. I can go the distance. And then Michael Bolton is actually, I will find my way. I can go the distance. <laughs> it's so good. Because in the movie ends, right where I belong. That's not rousing. Not after no. you've just heard Lilius White and LaShawn's in three-part harmony. To find where I belong. You want that. You know what I mean? And you just put the orchestra behind that. Did you know that Ricky Martin did a Spanish language version of Go the Distance? I did not. But also, can fucking Larry play Hercules in the Disney remake? <laughs> that was no, just, I mean, Jelani's that was just gonna the, be amazing. Tag him in. That Jelani's was the fucking amazing. audition. I like, like, obviously, like, growing up overweight, I was like, I am the hunchback, like, actually horrified to internalize. <laughs> but then, of course, they cast the hunchback as, like, you know, he's like, all about being, like, conventionally unattractive, and then they have uh, muscle twinks play him on stage, sure. and it's like, sure. okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, you like make it like like it was like so really you gotta just have a, like you know a little bit of curvature and hit the B flat and y'all choose him, Larry. Uh, you and I were tweeting about this some months back, but our our shared frustration at the uh, casting too many hunks as Seymour Krellborn. <sighs> mm-hmm. See, it just is it. So it's because they keep moving the line. So first they say you can't play the romantic leads because you don't look like them. And then when the structurally and textually they're not supposed to have those attributes, yes. then they still cast him. So what can I play, okay? Because it's a curveball. It's right. like, oh, they're doing something different. You don't want to see something different no, from like, them? No, like literally the industry just cannot go on without seeing like the most chiseled, <laughs> uh, like like outside of Jonathan Groff. Jonathan Groff is perfection. And then they were just starting to bring Hooten and Halle anybody up in there to that. And I was like, oh, I was like, okay, oh, oh okay. All right. Wow. Wow. Like, now that I was, like, gunning to be Seymour. But you you should be Seymour. I want to see you fucking play Seymour. It's Taron Edgerton. Like, this is a Seymour. (laughs) I know. That's what I'm saying. But when when fucking theaters reopen, I want you playing Seymour off Broadway. You should have a fucking run. Oh, my gosh. Honestly, I do love Seymour. Uh, so much. It, Little Shop was my uh, it was my senior year show at high school, and my uh, vindictive director he cast me in the ensemble because I did not want to play the plant. Disgusting. I was like, I'm not going to just be backstage hooting and hollering the soul. And yeah. my it's my senior year, I want to play the lead. I like I like in my soul, I feel much more close to someone who's like being overlooked and pining for love than I do for being a man eating like <laughs> like bloodthirsty. <laughs> <laughs> like monster like they literally he was like literally you play monster. the monster or you skip snip which is like <laughs> which is if you know the musical it's one yeah. third it's one fifth of a role that like an actor normally plays yes <laughs> so that's my like little shop trauma 
I will be good as Seymour. I, I admit I will be, be good as Seymour. You'd be good as Seymour. You'd be good as Seymour. I want to see it. It's also just frustrating to me. That's my favorite musical. And now it's just, it feels like every time they're like, can you believe the transformation? This guy somehow hid his pecs long enough to play Seymour. Jake Gyllenhaal. He, he d- somehow fit these glasses on his face. Right. I don't know how he did it. Gyllenhaal <laughs> remained with bangs. <laughs> What it says about like inner beauty is like so weird. Yes. Like it's like, it's like, I don't know. Honestly, it feels toxic. If, like it makes it like weird. Like she should be with someone who was like energetically like matching her, where like he has this like really inner, like big inner thing, but then like the world sees him with right. less value. And like she like is very coveted for how she looks, but no one is looking at her inside. If Seymour looks like Taryn Edgerton, then Audrey has already fucked Seymour, right? Like that's the thing. Like it like it ruins the poetry of the connection. And uh yeah, I just feel like it's dramaturgically unsound. And honestly, it's like it's it, it's vile but I, I agree hashtag Larry for Seymour I love it um, but yeah the music so uh, so there are some really amazing vocal moments and like I can't uh, my voice is bad right now it's truly tired it's, I can't do it but like it's when Ross Ryan in uh, the second Muse breakdown he had a plan to shake things up and that's the gospel the way she opens the trap. Like, these are, the vocals are insane. And that's the gospel. You get, like, four big, like, jump rope sine waves of shake. To roof. It's so Larry, good. Larry, how dare you share that bad voice on this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to cut. I'm sorry. We're going to have to cut, cut that, that out. Everyone is turning it down. They're like, how? <laughs> Ouch. I, it's just so good. And A Star is Born is actually like one of the best songs. It just, you just have to like wait till the end. Like, it's so good. I, I just, I, I like the whole thing. I just think this movie is a whole lot of fun. And a lot of it is probably my contrarian nature that I like that it's the movie that's kind of thumbing its nose at everything that Disney had only had success doing up until this point. Um, but I just think it's it's a movie where, like, uh, I don't know. It, it, is, it is free of self-seriousness in a way that gives it uh, some more emotional potency in other areas because it is not treating itself as epic. I think it's the only Disney movie where uh, where a black woman stays in her human form for the entire time. Very true. <laughs> or maybe even black persons like say like there's like not even I guess they they turn into stone for like they're in like a part of the vase, but they're always in human yeah. silhouette. I was gonna form. say that's more like they're depicted in different art forms, but they yeah, are always yeah, retaining they, like, their own body. Definitely bodies. human. That was yes. huge for me. I think it's why it absolutely stands out to me. And I like, I like, I just feel like, oh, and this is for another tangent for Susan Egan fans. There's a show on Disney Plus. It's called Encore, and it's hosted by Kristen Bell. But don't worry, she's not in it a lot. And so basically, <laughs> she introduces a group of high of like high school alums who go back to their literal high school to do their like high school play. And there's an episode where they do Beauty and the Beast and Susan Egan, who played Belle on Broadway, and also Meg and Hercules voiceover. She uh, she does like a side coaching of an actress as Belle singing the song Home. And it's amazing. <laughs> it's like you will cry. So Susan Egan fans, Disney Encore uh, and Disney Plus Encore. I will watch that. Um, uh, I, I just think like uh, the personal preference thing. But but like the, Phil getting the that's Phil's boy moment at the end of the movie really kind of gets to me. Mm. I I just think that's such a nice little quiet understated little arc they give him. Um, without without drawing it out too much. Uh, I want to share because I I found a, a larger sort of explanation of of the marketing blitz I was remembering. They did a thing for five months when this movie was coming out, starting in February, before it came out in the summer, called Disney's Hercules Mega Mall Tour. They went to 20 malls and essentially built a theme park inside each mall. They had 11 attractions, a multimedia stage show, a carousel theme to Baby Pegasus, a carnival with Hercules booths, and an animation workshop where they sent animators mall to mall to instruct kids how to draw. Then they did a Hercules parade in Times Square and aired it live on the Disney Channel. 
in the middle of the summer, like it was the Macy's parade with Lauren Hutton, Harvey Keitel, Andy Garcia, Barbara Walters, Michael Bolton, Mary Lou Henner, and Olympic athletes, which is a real potpourri of people who exist. Uh, Ed Koch, who was, hey. I guess, no longer president, publicly criticized the mayor. fact he that- was never the I, I'm sorry, sorry. Was no longer mayor, publicly criticized the fact that Giuliani had handed over the city to Disney to that degree. It became like a huge thing. Uh, yeah. A hundred members of the National Association of Broadcast Employees and Technicians used the occasion to strike for a new contract from DB Disney ABC, complained, I think the mayor gave away the city to Disneyland. It was that moment. And 5,000 businesses and residents who felt unusually eerie upon being asked to dim their lights as the parade passed. At the end of the parade, there was a private party where they rented out all of Chelsea Piers and had Susan Egan singing songs live on the Hudson River with fireworks. This is the moment where everyone's like, fuck Disney. Fuck them. Too much. And and Giuliani handing the city over to Disney was seen, right. It was seen as this sort of like, oh my God, like New York is dead. Like the, it was one of those many moments that people pronounce New York yeah. dead. I just think all of that uh, factored into this film's slightly more muted response, which is it made like ninety nine million dollars. Yeah. As Larry said, it made like two hundred thirty something worldwide. Two two fifty worldwide. It it did fine. But the the. It was it was a downward slope. It was the first one not to crack oh, yeah. 100 in a while. Lion King was like the third highest grossing film of all time at this point. Uh, it was a drop off. It was. And I think it just didn't have as big a tail that they did. You know, they did a, a direct to video prequel. Of course, they did an animated series, I believe. They canceled the the straight to video Hercules, too, because there's a story. Sylvia and Chomet director of triplets of Belleville oh. talks about that. He was one of the main people on Hercules too. And they canceled it because Hercules wasn't popular enough. And he, that was sort of his, what am I doing with my life moment? I should make a movie about French triplets. About, about old, old French ladies. One of them has a club foot and cycling. Um, and vacuum cleaner and the uh, dog on a bicycle or whatever. Right. Great, movie. Great movie. But, um, the, the prequel movie is this thing that Disney would do if the film wasn't successful enough to actually make a direct-to-video sequel. They would take the first three episodes of the TV show they already planned and release those. Right, right. So that's there's a Hercules prequel movie that is just three episodes of a TV show. And then there was a TV show that aired for a couple years. We should do the box office game, though, as we we're now talking do. about. The box office um, game. And once again, Griffin, I'm just checking with you, but I'm sure you agree. We should do the the wide. Yes, weekend. right. Not, not the New Amsterdam theater. Giuliani blesses Hercules, <laughs> gives him the key to the city weekend. Uh, this is it's, it's so it's opening number two, essentially. It's June 27th, 1997. Griffin. OK, it, and it opens at number two. Uh huh. Twenty one million dollars. What, what's your question? No, I was trying to think like big summer movies of 1997, but Men in Black is obviously July 4th. It's Big Willie weekend. Correct. Not, not yet. Men in Black has not yet uh, come out. Uh, the Lost World Jurassic Park has just fallen out of the right, top Right, because that was like so, Memorial so. Day. That's what I'm trying to think. I'm like, those, those are the two big movies of the summer in my memory. 97 is Lost World and Men in Black. So what is running the table in between those two? So uh, number one, it's new this week. It's a gr it's a movie for grownups. It's an action movie. It's a great hmm. movie. Hmm. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's got the kind of irreverent ever energy of a Hercules, but uh, much much more grown up. Is it Con Air? It's not Con Air, but <clears throat> that is number five, and you are in the right ballpark. It's Face Off. It's Face Off. I knew it was one or the other. Both in the top five, though. Those those Cage movies came out within like fucking two weeks of each other. It's crazy, really. Yeah, it is. It's very silly. But yes, they're both in the top five. But I think Con Air is the Hercules of Bruckheimer movies. I yeah, sure. I mean, I vastly prefer Face Off uh, as a cage experience. Hmm. But Con Air's, you know, it, it's got there's a lot to love there. I, I prefer Con Air, but I would argue that uh, a Face Off is kind of the Aladdin. So that tracks. You prefer Con Air? Well, well, we'll talk about that one day. That's that's okay. very interesting. Okay, number three, Griffin, though, mm -hmm. we have to talk about it, is is the, the one you're forgetting, the flop big movie of 1997. And, you know, flop is, you know, it's, it's made $75 million in two weeks. It's doing okay. Batman and Robin, right? 
Yes, exactly. Right. Chad Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin. So you, I mean, you talk about having seen Independence Day the year before this kind of putting you on the other side of Disney movies. My parents were so overprotective that like Lost World and Batman and Robin, those two movies this summer were like the first times I felt like I got to see a quote unquote adult blockbuster. And both of those movies are notorious for being kitty down. Toyetic. So I was still like, I was, everyone was fucking playing to me. I was so ready for Hercules because uh, I was like, oh, grown-up movies are exactly the same as kids' movies. Little girls do gymnastics and punch raptors. Batman has ice skates. I never have to grow up. <laughs> uh, number four, a great movie. Um, romantic comedy. Hmm. One of my favorites. A summer romantic comedy that's one of your favorites. It's not my best friend's wedding, right? It is. It is. My best friend's wedding. You got it right in one. I always thought that was a fall release for some reason, but something was it telling me. It does seem me. like a fall movie, yeah. but no, it came out in June. Wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Came out June 20th. Came out a week before. This is a good top five. You got Lost World. You got, all right, Speed 2, another bomb sequel, mm -hmm. number seven. You got Liar Liar, uh, Austin Powers, and then, of course, the biggest movie of them all, Gone Fishing. Of course. Pesci and Glover. J.J. Abrams. That's right. Uh, wait, so Austin Power. When does Austin Powers come out? Does it come out in April or May? Austin Powers comes out May 2nd, right okay. at the top of May. So it really is hanging in there. It's, it, it's hanging in there. I think that was part of why it got a sequel, right? Yeah. And had a good VHS run or whatever. But the right? VHS, it a... yeah, it broke like every VHS record. But it's also impressive that it's still in the top 10 almost two it, months later. Yeah. Awesome powers. Ah, uh, those were the days, Griffin. Uh, yeah. You'd watch TV, you'd see commercials for movies, you'd be excited to see the movie. I yeah, I mean, I miss I miss that. I also miss the thing that Awesome Powers is so emblematic of, which is something accidentally becoming a franchise. Right. Like something that had no designs, it was not planned on a spreadsheet to have different revenue streams. And to be able to be a four quadrant thing, it was some bizarre passion project from a guy who had kind of had a flop that then became a major franchise. It's Mike Myers, baby. Just like with Shrek. Yeah. See? When you it's make true. when you make it from the heart, it can blow up. You make it from the heart. Just like Love Guru. <laughs> oh. It never fails. As long as it comes from the heart, like the Love Guru, it never fails. And and you know the most famous movie to come from uh, two people's hearts. Which one? Treasure. Oh, Planet. Treasure Planet. Of course. Larry. And that's what's next on Blank Check. That's thank you for next on setting us Check. up. What a perfect setup. Uh, Larry, thank you so much for being on the show. That was a perfect setup. It was a perfect setup. You're you're a prince and a king and a duke. <laughs> a prince and a king. And a lord. I don't know. How many different titles can I bestow <laughs> upon you? The Duke of Hastings. I look yeah. forward to your Bridgerton series. Uh, is there anything you want to plug? I know you always tell people to listen to Strange Loop on Spotify. <laughs> yes, you can listen to I me mean, sing that score on Spotify. Uh, and you, know, you can follow me on uh, at Larry Owens Live, wherever my uh, platforms are not deactivated. Uh, I understand if it is a thing you can not talk about, but is there any possibility of Strange Loop coming back on stage in some capacity on the other side of this? Absolutely. Everyone take your vaccines and social distance. Great. Because uh, that's what I want to see. Uh, Larry was <laughs> fucking unbelievable in that show. He won the Drama Desk Award. The show won the Pulitzer. It's an incredible performance. Uh, and I hope people get to see it at large. This podcast has only one Obies. We don't have any drama. We, we have zero drama desks. Yeah. Uh, also, people should watch Larry's drama desk acceptance speech, which he no, don't it's watch really that. Can, good. No, it's so bad. I honestly think I've archived it. Larry, you can I think watch it's me so on, good. You can watch me on High Maintenance. Hell yeah. On HBO. Yeah. Great on High Maintenance. Um, let's see when episode five of Dash and Lily Christmas is over. I got cut from Search Party, so you can't watch me on that. And um, yeah, I won the Drama Desk, the uh, Lucille Lortel, and the OB. And you, hey, the Triple Crown. Yes, hat trick, baby. In incredible performance, incredible show. Thank you so much for being here, Larry. I look forward to seeing you live on stage again. It is truly one yes. of the things I keep in my mind as like, that's a thing to look forward to in the oh world. Oh my gosh. Being able Thank to go you. to a bar, being able to see Larry Owens live, all these things I miss. <laughs> Staples of <laughs> New York you. culture. Uh, oh my gosh. 
folks, thank you so much for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thanks to Joe Bowen and Pat Reynolds for our artwork and the great American novel, Leigh Montgomery, for our theme song. Go to blankies.reddit.com for some real nerdy shit. Go to our Shopify page for some real nerdy merch. Uh, tune in next week, as David said, and as Larry so oh, perfectly set up, Treasure Planet. We're going That's treasure right. hunting. We're, go we're going to space. A first time watch for you, and I have not seen it since it was in theaters. Bingo. Very excited to revisit it. I, I mean, I got the same ads as Larry of, I just, I want that movie to be an unsung masterpiece. I want to watch it and go, no one gives this movie credit. They were right. Time will catch up. I'm, I'm hoping to. I'm looking for a gem here. Uh, diamond in the rough, if you will. A diamond in the rough. And you can go to our Patreon, of course, Blank Check Special Features to hear us do commentaries on the Star Trek movies, which are my cold watches. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, God. I'm go so and trek excited him. to do that. David, I'll show you off screen, but I've been buying a lot of Star Trek action figures off of... Uh, <sighs> eBay, and I also got a box set of everything. I'm I'm fully in the tank now for Trek. Hell yeah. I'm all in. Uh, folks, thanks again. And as always, Larry, can you please sing any line you choose from Hercules? Oh, yeah. Bless my soul. Herc was on a roll. First another week at every Greek and painful. What a pro. Herc is top of show. Point them out. I'm also at you talking SRO. 